Welcome to Everything Change, Cloiso Inewid Popith, 10 days of talks, conversations, readings and performances about creativity and adaptive thinking in response to the climate and ecological crises. When it comes to drastically reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and protecting biodiversity, we largely know and have known for a long time what we have to do. The challenge facing us now, therefore, is perhaps more one of the imagination than of action. How might we, as individuals, nations, as species, imagine a different way of being on this planet? How might we imagine a fairer, healthier future for ourselves, our children, and the natural world upon which we rely to survive? How might creativity across the arts, sciences, business, law, policy, activism, education, help make that future feel not just vital, but possible? These are some of the questions that we'll be exploring in Everything Change through artistic provocations, events with two of the world's leading writers, and seven interdisciplinary conversations across seven crucial areas of change. Money, food, water, energy, justice, story, and change itself. What are the consequences for ecocide becoming a crime against humanity? How and where should responsibilities for tackling threats to biodiversity fall across regions and generations? If our laws are a framework of our morals, then should they change in response to climate change? And how might they give us the powers we need to avert it? Thank you for joining us for another panel discussion of Everything Change, in which we'll be exploring the role of the law in helping us reach a fair, low-carbon, sustainable future. Chaired by former Welsh Government Minister for Environment, Jane Davidson, this is Changing Justice. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very exciting panel this afternoon, where we will be debating climate, racial gender and intergenerational justice. And to start us off, the artistic provocation for this event will be from Cheryl Beer. Cheryl is a hearing impaired environmental sound artist and musician who has created award-winning projects exploring the relationship between sonic place and the poet and the ethics of humanity. Currently, she has repurposed seeing and hearing a technology to widen sonic access to the senses by transposing and notating the biorhythms of the natural world. So over to Cheryl. I can remember succinctly the first moment that everything changed. Just one thing shifted and it completely altered who I am as a person and in turn, my work as an artist, a composer and musician for over 35 years. I was living in West Wales in a little stone cottage opposite the woods. And every evening I'd leave my window open ajar so that I could be awakened by birdsong. But on this particular morning, I awoke to silence, all but for the ringing of a high pitched screeching noise that set my whole nervous system on edge bit like nails down glass. Where are the birds today? I asked. Why have the birds stopped singing? Overnight, I had become hearing impaired with hearing loss, tinnitus, and a sound sensitivity called hyperacusis. But I hadn't just lost my hearing. I'd lost my career, my sense of self, and my identity. When I was fitted with my NHS hearing aids, it was nothing short of an awakening. This incredible technology was filling in the physical gaps that hearing loss had left, and nature was healing the scars. I wept with joy when I woke up to the birds singing. I ran to the woods to listen to the leaves and the breeze, wondered at the sound of raindrops in puddles. <laughs> I'd learnt firsthand the remarkable healing that environmental sound can have on the well-being of humanity. 
and what it is like to live without it. Slowly, I began thinking about work again. How could I repurpose these pieces of technology and my deepened relationship with the natural world to bring the healing power of environmental sound to others, raising awareness of how intrinsic nature is to our thriving survival? In January this year, I began to explore this question more deeply, basing myself just five minutes from my new home, working with the high tides along the Millennium Coastal Path, which in actual fact has an enormous flood defense wall. I began collecting the spectral frequency of high tides. Now, audiologists use spectral frequency and digital sound to measure hearing absence, but in measuring that absence, what is present? Ah, pitch. And where there is pitch, there are notes. <laughs> I realized I could actually notate again by measuring what was present within the absence. I'd almost given up hope of ever writing music again, but by working with nature and technology in this new way, I became a conduit composer. Can you imagine how that felt? Discovering a way to notate the natural biorhythms of nature through the visualization of sound. <laughs> Every cell of my body was firing. I can remember sitting in my studio and thinking to myself, wow, how can I apply this new way of understanding the natural world? Right here in Wales, there are four remaining but declining pockets of rainforest that have been carbon dated back 10,000 years. And it is here in these rainforests that I begin my mission, reuniting these four remaining pockets of temperate rainforest to create a sound sculpture that will raise awareness of our fragile eco history through my personal story. And beyond this, it is my vision to continue transposing and notating the areas of environmental distress across the globe, from the wetlands of China to the melting ice caps of Antarctica. This one shift in the way I hear the world means for me most radically that as a disabled artist, I believe I can make significant impact on climate change. And furthermore, that in repurposed in disability technology through a creative lens, disability arts has the capacity to change the world. And so it is with a regained sense of self that I leave you with this. My name is Cheryl Beer. I am a hearing impaired environmental sound artist, the conduit composer. What an extraordinary contribution. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And looking at the way in which that single moment of change actually galvanized you to do something completely different. What we're looking at today is what role can laws and justice systems play in helping us reach that low carbon sustainable future. All our panelists are activists with strong and coherent views on how we should address the climate and ecological crises uh, falling across countries and generations. And we'll be considering just how far good law could contribute to tackle the climate and ecological crisis. So to start by introducing our incredibly talented panelists today, first, may I welcome Scarlett Westbrook. Scarlett is a leading climate justice activist and is currently the youngest person in the world to have an A-level in government politics, which she attained at the age of 13 and she is just 16 now. She specialises in environment and education policy, informing the work she does today as member of the UK Student Climate Network, the organisation behind the school climate strikes. She's an opinion writer with words in The Independent, ID, Metro and Gal Dem, among others. 
and she's been named one of Greenpeace's 30 under 30 activists and is the 2020 recipient to both Women of the Future Young Star Award and the IPPR Big Ideas Award. Welcome Scarlett. Our second panelist uh, is Adetola Stephanie Onamadi. Now Ade is a student involved in anti-racist anti-capitalist and decolonial movements, including uh, university climate and social justice campaigning, as well as uh, decolonization through alternative education. She's a trustee of Plan B, which supports the emergence of a networked international movement of legal action to prevent catastrophic climate change. Plan B, by the way, is currently taking Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak to court for violating the Paris Agreement. So a big welcome to you, Adi. Our third panelist is Saida Rizwana Hassan. Rizwana is a lawyer of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and the Chief Bangladesh Environmental Laws Association, Bella, and has promoted environmental justice in Bangladesh for many years and received many awards uh, for her work, including the Goldman Environment Prize, which is awarded to grassroots activists, the Ramon Magsese Award for her uncompromising courage and impassioned leadership in a campaign of judicial activism in Bangladesh based on people's right to a good environment as nothing less than their right to dignity and life. And she's been named also as one of the 40 environmental heroes of the world by Time magazine. And last but not least, Jojo Mehta. Jojo co-founded Stop Ecocide International in 2007 alongside the late barrister and legal pioneer Polly Higgins to support the establishment of ecocide as a crime at the International Criminal Court, the fifth crime against peace. As executive director and key spokesperson, she's overseeing the remarkable growth of the movement while coordinating between legal developments, diplomatic traction and public narrative. So a very, very warm welcome to you as well, Jojo. Scarlett, please, can I hand over to you? Um, hello everybody, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I think this event is really exciting because the concept of justice is something that's ever changing and probably different to everyone. For me personally, I think justice as a concept is how we put in measures to go forwards from disastrous events um, rather than about trying to make up for them because I don't think that's something we can really ever do. So whether that's things like putting in preventative measures, like investing in rehabilitation youth services or eradicating poverty or investing in green energy, justice isn't about like caste or punishment. It's about building a future that doesn't replicate the same problems. Um, this same concept can translate to the climate crisis. As the clock to total climate breakdown keeps ticking, it's time to break business as usual. And it's time to put an end to handing out tax breaks to fossil fuel corporations, time to stop fueling a profit driven crisis through legislation that centres um, corporate greed and devalues both people, unless they're billionaires, of course, and the planet. Um, it also means looking at this from a wider global lens. So during historic periods of colonialism, countries in the so called global north, um, such as Britain, exploited nations in the so called global south for capital gain. These countries' lack of resources due to the colonial damage that they've endured means that their response to the climate crisis is limited, even though they're going to be experiencing the impact of the climate crisis disproportionately. Climate justice means that we create equitable and just ways to go forward from this, to repay our glo global carbon debt and make reparations for our colonial damage. We could provide those in the global south with the climate resilience technology, economic capacity and resources needed to decarbonize, ensuring that our own decarbonization isn't at the cost of their economy and political autonomy. Um, so in my opening words are just, this is how we move forwards not backwards, trying to make up for things that we won't ever be able to, because the future is green if we have a just future. Thank you so much um, for such a, a, a persuasive uh, introduction. And now over to Ade. Thank you. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice, I'm slightly um, on my iPad. In the context of justice, 
our case with Plan B and Stop the Manga Mizi Recharge Genocide Ecocide Campaign attempts to use something called critical legal praxis or law as resistance. And Stop the Manga Mizi is a collection of our our elders, our Afri African ancestral wisdom um, is brought into the case through this. Law as resistance means making the laws in our image, especially as people of the global majority who <clears throat> are disproportionately facing the brunt of the climate and ecological crisis. When we look at the millions and billions predicted to be displaced by 2050 and the fact that um, 80% of women are sexually assaulted and raped on their um, way as displacement. We know who the global majority are, and we know that they are predominantly in the global South as well. And the UK government has a historic obligation to mitigate and adapt um, in line with Paris Agreement, other agreements that they have signed on to, and the international obligations being enshrined in domestic law is something that has failed to be done um, and is required for us to reach the scale of transformative justice that is needed. Um, for us as the three young people taking this action, we are part of the diaspora and that means that our families are also in the global south or global majority. And part of us standing up there is saying we refuse to be complicit in what the UK government and the UK justice system is trying to do, which is actually uh, enshrine the, the, the will and the rights of big corporations, um, financial institutions with over 15% of financial flows going through the city of London is a huge part of it and it's a huge part of the regulation needed. These measures have not been put in place and <clears throat> the Committee on Climate Change report actually came out um, very recently and uh, they acknowledge that the UK government has paid very little attention to the planning for the risks. So in line with the risk level and adaptation, we have now moved further and further away from the reality of the climate crisis, which is seen by those directly on the front line already. And so even here in the UK, we've seen people fight to have their rights to life, their rights to family life, and their right to not be discriminated against, um, including Rosamund Ado Kisi Debra, who fought for Ella Kisi Debra in um, her being recognised as the first young, <clears throat> the first ever person to have air pollution on their death certificate, and that is a horrible thing for a mother to have to do and to have to campaign so hard on. But that being enshrined in law and in justice is exactly what law as resistance is, and. It shouldn't fall on individual responsibility for these uh, things to be enshrined in justice as they are our human rights and the global majority deserves dignity in their rights to life and rights to a future. Thank you so much, Adi. I mean, so powerfully put. Can I now turn to you, Rizwan? A very warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, I think law can do many good things to a society, but it depends on who actually enforces, implements, and who makes the laws. So if you are not in a proper democratic society and laws are made by uh, military rulers, you may not get the results that you actually want to get from law, and that is justice. I often feel that in cases that I win on environment and climate, I get judgments. I do not necessarily get justice. Because for you to get justice, it has to be timely. It has to be strong enough. It has to be clear and it has to be implemented. So for in countries like ours, we get judgments, but the second round of process actually starts for implementation of the judgments that we get. I think the good uh, side of having good laws in hand is 
particularly in the area of climate justice and environmental justice, the laws can question the unsustainable model of developments by putting checks and balances here and there, both substantive, both in a substantive way and in a procedural way. So in that way, the, the laws can actually promote what we call is sustainable development. For example, a law can require public participation before a major development scheme is approved. The law can shift the focus from uh, being anthropocentric to ecocentric. Laws, by having clear substantive, substantive provisions, can actually translate mere promises to actual commitments. Laws can put checks on the unregulated behaviors of the corporations and states. Law can actually keep uh, the identity of the states different from the identity of the corporations. In third world realities, due to corruption, we see the identities marching. Law can actually give voice to people like indigenous communities. It can give voice to other species. For example, it can protect the Royal Bengal Tigers of Bangladesh from the threats that a coal-based power plant is actually exposing them to. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I think that um, your lead in uh, to our next panelist in terms of moving from anthropocentric to ecocentric is a is a very clever one. Over to you, Jojo. Thank you so much. And what an inspiring panel to be on. And we seem to have already touched on. So law is something that's dynamic and law is resistance. Law is something that can be a tool and, and law is also something that can give a voice to the voiceless. Um, and I think the the really inspiring thing about working as I do on, on the criminalization of ecocide, in other words, making mass destruction of ecosystems and international crime um, really sort of sort of fits very well into that curve and I think it's important to think about how a lot of the responses to climate change um, sort of globally at the political level also in the economic world have focused around you know how we play the current game better um, and 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 the result of that is that we are moving far far too slowly in the direction that is needed in order to meet the severity of the crisis that we're facing and of course bringing in um, a serious crime against nature in other words of ecocide at the top level um, moves sort of beneath all of that not just to how you play the game but what are the fundamental rules what are the ground rules um, and that is uh, what criminal law can address um, at a level that the regulatory side of environmental law, which is where most environmental law sits, uh, simply cannot reach because with criminal law, we, we draw moral lines. Um, not just so, so you can't go to a government and, and, and ask them for a permit to kill a few hundred people for your new business. Completely unacceptable, totally morally taboo, and of course, criminally illegal. Um, but you can go to a government and ask for a permit for activities that we know at their most extreme do create very serious damage to nature. And so we haven't yet put that, uh, we haven't yet drawn that red line as regards the damage to our environment. Um, and this is the, the sort of core focus of what the Stop the Excite Foundation and the international campaign um, that um, I'm working with it, it focuses on. Um, so it, it, it's the potential to, you know, we don't believe that uh, criminalizing each side will fix everything. But what we do believe is that it's almost like a kind of acupuncture needle, a strategic intervention that can that has the potential to, uh, you know, to, to sort of trigger a bit of a change in consciousness when you put uh, serious damage to nature at the top level alongside war crimes alongside genocide as a serious uh, international crime of concern to the international community as a whole you're sending a very very strong message saying that damaging the natural world is as bad as damaging people and property and not only that but the two things are linked um, and and that that effectively climate justice social justice and environmental justice are all deeply connected um, and the missing piece in the environmental sphere is this kind of fundamental uh, foundational piece that says this far and no further this much damage it is not okay to create um thanks thanks so much um 
Jojo. I mean, I think what's been really interesting in these um, these first op opening statements and um, Ade and Scarlett, if you can put your cameras back on um, uh, as we move into discussion together, that would be brilliant. But I think one of the things that that, that struck me in in in, in these op opening statements um, is the, is the concept of law as opportunity to reframe. Um, and I did, that's a, a very important opportunity now. And um, uh, Rizwana uh, outlined, um, you know, some of those opportunities, um, you know, in, in, in incredibly effectively. But I want to start by going back to um, Cheryl's contribution. Um, very powerful. And I think that right there in the sort of first sentence of what she was saying was, you know, that she could remember the first moment that everything changed. I mean, that was a fundamental change for her, wasn't it? I mean, literally um, becoming hearing impaired overnight. But the fr how she framed it was just one thing shifted and completely altered who I am as a person and my work. Um, so I wondered, all of you, what, what, what has made you the campaigners you are? What is the one thing, or maybe the, the final thing, it may have been a series of things um, that led up to uh, what, what, who you are now and what you're doing now and why you're doing it. Um, so I think we need some personal stories here. So <laughs> who's, who's, who's prepared to respond to that, to that challenge first? I'm, I'm happy to take that go, first go, go because there, there, was, there was very definitely a, a moment for me so I'm happy to do that. Um, I mean I think I had been what you might call an armchair activist for some years you know with a with very sort of strong underlying concern around environmental and ecological issues you know clicking on petitions and you know sending messages to MPs and that sort of thing. But what I think got me uh, out of that armchair was the discovery of fracking uh, quite a long you know quite a while back before the UK was very familiar with it back in this, is, this was around 2013 I think and I was really shocked when I started researching and, and realizing that the, the po pollution potential of this practice and I was talking about it with friends and my little daughter who was five then um, overheard me and she burst into tears and she said, mommy, I don't understand. If they're poisoning the ground, surely they, re they realize they're going to poison themselves. Can't you call them and tell them to stop? Mm -hmm. And I said to her, well, I'm not sure how much difference it'll make me just calling up one of these company offices. And she said, there must be someone you can talk to. And, and we had recently been to the local ballot box. She'd accompanied me to a local election. And she said, mommy, can't you talk to the voting man? And, and I thought, gosh, I'm really being called into, you know, into responsibility here. And I, and I made this appointment to speak to, to my local MP, who is a conservative MP. Um, and I put this to him with my daughter at my side. Um, and he did this uh, classic sort of politician thing of avoiding every question, somehow slipping away from every question I was asking. And I remember coming out of that meeting thinking that is never happening again. I am going to inform myself and, you know, make sure that I know exactly what I'm talking about and, and not be diverted. And, and that's what, you know, in a sense, sort of gave me my boots on the ground. And I started researching and giving talks and doing surveys and, and all of that. And that ultimately led me to the um, encounter with Polly Higgins and the, and, and, and the work on Ecoside. Well, well, thank you. So it was your five-year-old who motivated you. So Scarlett, I'm going to come to you next, if I may, because, you know, you burst upon the world a couple of years ago, didn't you? Inspired by Greta and involved in the uh, school strikes against climate. What, what really motivated you? Um, so I think I got politically active first when I was 10. So the 2015 general election, which is quite a long time ago now, um, and I think that was mainly because in our year five teacher encouraged us to read the news. So when I read the news, it was like people are dying from austerity and the Paris Convention is happening next year. We've got like a year to come up with these ambitious demands and all of this sort of stuff. And I was like, I want to get involved with this. Um, so I went and harassed my teacher a bit, um, asking about what politics was like in this country and how I could get involved in that sort of stuff. Um, and then when the general election came around, I started canvassing um, for the Labour Party based on Ed Miliband's commitment to decarbonisation at the Paris Convention. 
and I, I don't think I knew that much about him as a person but I did know about the climate aspect so I kind of just like went for it and um, sat at 10 I was just knocking on people's doors and asking them to vote for Labour because of the Paris Convention and then I think it was the following year Brexit was happening and I got involved then again um more like things I do now more so speaking at protests and that sort of thing and again it was mainly on that climate angle um so talking about like the climate crisis in the EU and how they're all sort of interlinked um like when it comes to funding for green technology and that sort of stuff um and then a few months later I chose to do my A-level in government politics and that's kind of like um what with what Jojo was saying about how she wanted to make sure she knew everything so she couldn't be like dismissed by politicians I was 12 at this point and the main thing I was getting was like you're 12 you don't know anything um you have no life experience so I was like okay then I'll do an A-level um so I self-taught that to myself in seven months because my school wouldn't let me do it my I asked my deputy head teacher and she just laughed at me so I was like okay I'll, I'll just teach myself that's cool and I, I did do that um <laughs> And then when the climate strikes um, started getting set up, I also um, became involved in the organisation of those and organised the ones here in Birmingham, where I am right now, and then started helping out in other locations. And now we're here. Yeah, and I think <laughs> so your, the, the journeys, they, they start in different places and they brought us all here on, 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 on this call today. Rizwana, what about you? I mean, you've got this incredible CV in terms of taking on the world from Bangladesh and becoming a very well known across the world for what you do. Uh, I come of a political family. So while others target the politicians, I think it is the political orientation that I had from my childhood to work with and to work for the people. So when I joined this organization, Bella, after a few months, I decided to leave because I was given a research work where I was supposed to go through the fishery related laws. And I told to myself that I've got distinctions in all my academic results. I'm not going to stay here and read the laws about fishery. But then when I was sent to the field and I started interacting with the communities, that is where I drew the force from. I knew for sure that if I don't stay by the side of the communities, they will not have that many lawyers to represent their voices. And the grievances that they had were very genuine. It, those were genuine, not only for their own cause, they were very genuine and very important for the whole country, for the survival of all of us. That is when I decided that no, if I have to do something and if I have to practice law, then I will be working for these communities and be their lawyer. And hence, hence the recognition of your role um, as a grassroots environmentalist and 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 all of you um have a major role in terms of taking that grassroots role as well Adi, what about you because you're doing something incredibly brave at the moment you know the three of you uh with the dia in the diaspora challenge um so i think for me something that changed everything um was when i firmly saw the connection between racial and environmental and social justice um, during university. And this was actually during the UCU, so the University College Union, uh, striking at my university, Queen Mary. Uh, and we, I hadn't uh, witnessed that sort of like, uh, lack of solidarity from the students before that, um, moment and I didn't understand I didn't understand why people didn't care about what was going on um, and we held t various teach outs um, during that time uh, which were very grassroots and very uh, just honestly speaking to professors and lecturers on a uh, far more horizontal level than I'd ever been able to do at a higher education where I didn't necessarily have a voice um, so in that, in those teach outs, we had uh, coffee shop type discussions as well. And we, we actually, I connected with one of the professors who did the King's College uh, paper that shows that children from uh, BAME backgrounds have five to 10% decreased lung capacity. And so 
uh, hearing, we, we asked him to do sort of a presentation for some of the students and we could have a discussion uh, around the ways in which we're holding our, our own university to account. So that was incredibly powerful to hear how it was actually someone involved in our university who was part of that research team and then the university would know this of course the departments know this and they, they still failed to uh, take the things that students and staff were saying and signing uh, to account properly so we had a petition with uh, thousands of signatures it didn't it, it, they didn't hear anything again this dodging and diverting happened and then uh, yeah just decided that you the, the portrayal that we're facing, we, we can't solve it from just talking up at them. We have to talk with one another in, in dialogue. And um, yeah, so that's part of something that was very... Yeah, no, 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 thank you. I mean, it, it's, it's really interesting what, what becomes the, the moment um, of change, I think. I mean, I, I remember, you know, most people think the ministers have amazing amounts of authority <laughs> until you become a minister and you find out that actually, if you've ever watched the, the programme Yes Minister, you find out that actually you've got people around you who spend all their time trying to constrain your authority <laughs> to make sure that you don't make a decision that's difficult for the civil service to implement. And it, it just, um, it, it sort of, you know, in the context of, of the, the of the journey of Wales, since that's that's where we are. You know, the um, National Assembly for Wales had a duty to promote sustainable development that was given it in 1999, but it wasn't a duty to deliver. And when I was the minister, I wanted to make it a duty to deliver because I found, to my shock, that um, uh, it we had never failed on our duty to promote. So we may not have achieved but we'd never failed on our duty to promote. Um, what we then needed was a duty to deliver, hence the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And the commissioner, Sophie Howell, will be talking about that on the event tomorrow. But I thought it was quite an important lesson about what's in the law, which goes back, Rizwana, to something you were saying. So about you need, the law needs to be good enough for the task in hand. And so um, what do you all think would be the best law to tackle the thing that you most care about? And I'll come to Jojo last because, I mean, she's been campaigning on this for ages. But, um, you know, what would be the best law if you could wave that wand um, and, uh, and, and create a law? What would be the best law to tackle the things that you most care about? Rizwana, can I come to you first on that? I think the law should... It may sound very loaded, but I believe in it. I think the law should actually set a transformative agenda for the society. It can't be business as, as usual. And for the law to actually address the problem of injustice, be it climate, human rights, environment, it should actually be process oriented. Should not just only be saying this is right, that is wrong. And this is... Uh, this is the punishment. That is not how law probably would be delivering. Most of the judgments that I uh, get, I rely on the constitutional provision that does not say uh, the imprisonment term of the offender. It actually sets the spirit, the vision for a society. So I think the law really, uh, the laws really need to embrace the vision of a just society be it climate just, environment just, human rights just, gender just, it has to embrace the vision of a just society and it has to be more elaborate on process. Often many people ask that if an international law is violated, there is no punishment, there is no sanction. But the fact remains that if you really do not comply with the Paris agreements, yes, you will not be imprisoned, you will not be fined, you will not be required to compensate. But the fact remains that you will actually be putting your children to great, great danger. And that is the punishment that you will see end of the day. So that spirit has to be um, there in the law so that people really know why it has to be respected, why it has to be complied with. I think that that's really um, interesting because most laws don't include processes, do they? And yet we do need the, both the what the law is about 
and how to get there. I mean, unusually, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act actually enshrines within it five ways of working. It demands long termism, prevention, um, uh, collaboration, integration of the goals and involvement of people about whom the laws are being made. And that approach is unique. Uh, just as apparently, um, and somebody I'd love to know that this is not the case, that Wales, which is not a member state, is the only country in the world which actually has a legal mechanism uh, to deliver on the SDGs. So we've got a long way to go to get the laws that we want. So our two young campaigners, <laughs> over to you. What is the law that you would, uh, that, that you would like to see? Um, to deliver on, 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 on the areas that you're most concerned about. Um, Scarlett. Um, so I would like to see a Green New Deal, which is a 10 year government led mobilisation to rapidly decarbonise the economy, whilst also bridging the existing inequality gap in society and also across the world. So we'd see things like a warmer homes for all policy, which means insulating every house so that it's more energy efficient. It would mean things like cancelling global debt and colonial reparations, um, investing in green energy. It would also mean things like changing the education system so that it incorporates climate education into every aspect of the curriculum. Um, because obviously it's all good making laws now, but we need to make sure that they're sustainable and that future generations can continue them. So there's no better place to start that than in schools. Um, and also means decarbonising buildings. So for example, decarbonising buildings in the education sector um, and that sort of stuff. So the Green New Deal is obviously a, a lot of a lot of policies packaged into this one 10 year scheme. Uh, but it's all about decarbonizing and making a more like green friendly um, economy, whilst also bridging inequality and looking at the interconnection of social justice and climate justice. Um, because we know that people of colour and people from low socioeconomic backgrounds will be more disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis. So we need to make sure that we have policy that specifically um, recognises that and make sure those communities are helped rather than treat it as a blanket thing that everyone will be impacted by equally when that isn't the case. Yeah, no, no that's great. I mean, which is the, um, all under a values framework that is driving a completely different way of operation, which is um, very important points that were made by Jojo, for example, as well in the in, in context. Addy, you were nodding enthusiastically. You're, you're up for Scarlet's Laws. <laughs> very much so. Um, people already touched on Green New Deal and transformative justice as well. Um, but I'm really struggling to pick one. <laughs> um, so for me, I think I wouldn't even call it a law. Um, I would, <clears throat> for me, it would just be a um, far more participatory democracy in terms of, I'm going to, I want to give an example, um, which is the Silvertown Tunnel, um, which some people may know about already, but with the models of transformative justice and Green New Deal, for example, um, like they're very necessary, but I don't, uh, I don't know how much impact it would make to our actual officials and they because ultimately they're not accountable to people they want to be accountable to and that's um, part of why uh, Rizwana's suggestion is so important I think because the people who are being harmed have to be centered for the repair to actually be able to be done and to be the most effective and so uh, with this Silvertown tunnel, the uh, local residents, uh, <laughs> only 40% of their uh, households in Neom actually have a car. And there's a lot, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of discontent, but that is not anything that uh, Sadiq Khan can be held to account for um, unless those processes are actually in place. So. Uh, I think, and, that, and also you've got that point that um, law is only as good sometimes as its enforcement, haven't you? So there has to be those mechanisms for in, in, in enforcement, which is why we wish you all the best in your major challenge being taken through Plan B. Jojo, what, what about in applying your, your big principles about ecocide at the more local level? What would, you, what would your demand be of the UK government tomorrow in the context of, of, of your work? I mean, I think, I mean, obviously we focus very much on the kind of global side of things. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that we would, you know, we would actually encourage the UK government to support us at the international level um, 
before necessarily addressing it at the local national level. And there's a very clear political reason for that is that um, governments are quite wary of moving forward on a sort of fundamental uh, law like this one on their own or sort of being first on the block, if you like, um, because of often because of embedded economic relationships and also the, just the ability to to sort of move into a new space very quickly. And so what what we actually campaign for it at the international level, um, precisely because the protection of our environment actually is a global issue and we all need to move forward together on it but also because the time span that that allows um for building the you know obviously there's time needed to build the consensus and the, and, and the momentum around it in order to get enough states to put it forward at the international level what that is is, an, is a real opportunity for the uk government and any government to say you know we support this in principle you know when the time is right we'll be there and they it, it is an opportunity to to really lead in the space while knowing that they don't have to take immediate action tomorrow but what that does and this sort of speaks a little bit more to what Rizwana was talking about about a vision um, and about the sort of you know, what's involved in, in, in moving this law forward is that when people can see it coming um, you know, maybe on the horizon, it may not be here yet, but actually that's very important because it gives people a sense of uh, almost a compliance period. You know, we, this isn't here yet, but it's coming. And what does that mean? What transition policies do we need to put in place? You know, what compliance pathways do we need to look at in order, you know, for this to come into being? And, and not just in order for it, but just seeing that actually this is probably inevitable it's just we don't know exactly when it's going to come in but we need to really think about that because you know investors and insurers and ceos and policymakers i mean they all know that kind of seismic changes are needed i mean we've seen from the reports coming from the un after we'll see you know countries are you know way behind where they need to be to even have any remote chance of meeting paris targets you know by 2030 as as, as we're hoping they're doing or or you know reaching sustainable development goals so you know there, there is a parameter that is, you know, people are aware that there's something that is needed. And, and you know, we believe that this, you know, even before this comes into place, you know, this is this is something that can that can have a really strong effect. Um, and I think, I mean, I'd, I'd love to just speak very, very briefly to a couple of the points that were brought up by, by the others, um, because I think education, which Scarlett was talking about, I think is also hugely important. And I think that, you know, a lot of uh, the kind of current global sort of colonial extractivist kind of paradigm is is very much inculcated through the Western education into the elites in the different places around the world. And and so I think, you know, looking at what we're actually educating our children into um, and, and, and having a reality check about what are the important issues and what are actually going to be the existential issues within a relatively short space of time it is going to be actually hugely important and then finally slightly perhaps controversially because I know there are people who sit on different sides of this fence but I, I used to I had a friend who, who, who used to ask me you know if you were if you were prime minister what's the one policy you would go for which feels a little bit like this this question and at the time this was before I became so deeply embedded in this particular campaign which is just feels like the biggest game in town which is incredible but it was it was almost like I, I was looking at one side at eco side law and at the other at the concept of universal basic income. And the reason I say that is that change makers that I meet and I've met so many incredible change makers over the last few years all seem to have one thing in common, and that is that they've got some time. It doesn't it isn't always a lot, but they've got some time in which they can invest their energy in alignment with their values um, and, and, and actually affect change. Because when, when, when I talk to people on an individual basis, I mean, I find there is so much in common. I mean, there's so much more in common between people than there is that divides them. You know, the, the, the values of, you know, of love, of fairness, of equality, all of these things. And yet most of us are essentially wage slaves. You know, effectively people are having to work their, you know, 40 hours, maybe 50 hours, 60 hour weeks, just to put bread on the table. And when that's what you've done, quite often in a, in a job that may not have any meaning to you particularly, how much energy do you have left to change the things that you can see need changing? And so for me, you know, the idea of everybody having some kind of basic income or the ability to meet those basic needs would free up an unbelievable degree of imagination, initiative, energy, you know, to, to actually move things into a more positive space for, for all of us.
Well, thank you. I'd be pleased to know it's going to be piloted in Wales. <laughs> Universal <Is> thing. <laughs> One of the manifesto commitments linked to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So um, we've got lots of questions coming through. Um, please, panellists, have a look at the Q&A. Um, there are a number of people um, who are very um, critical uh, and a particular uh, attendee who's really been very, very badly dealt with by the justice system. Um, what advice do the panel have for others who see injustice and want to take action? We'll pick up a couple of questions. So uh, if, if um, any of you'd like to come in on that, on, on that question, then we'll pick up another couple as well before the end of the session. I'm, I'm very happy to come in on that very briefly. Um, I think I don't know a single activist that hasn't um, had a kind of a wake up moment or a moment of outrage, you know, of, of, of this, you know, this just isn't something here just isn't right and, and, and needs to something needs to be done about it. And so for me, the the direction, if you're, you know, really wanting to kind of step up and, and, and contribute and do something, that point of outrage is going to be your inspiration, but your way of going about it is going to be the thing you love doing. So it's like, how do I apply the thing that I'm passionate about doing to the thing that really makes me angry? <laughs> um, and at that point, uh, that for me is, is where a kind of a balance lies so that you, you're not necessarily having to sit in that rage, but you can apply what you know you're good at into that arena. That That's my first feeling. And uh, perhaps... Um... Um, a number of people, a number of you have mentioned the sort of fossil fuel issues. Are there, I mean, we know, uh, particularly in the context of COVID, that when you look at the analysis of, um, of funding by governments for fossil fuels, it's either gone up or, main, or, or stayed the same. So um, what law, I mean, Scarlett, you mentioned this, what, what law might you want to see particularly again about the fossil fuel companies you meant you mentioned it at the outset but that's been picked up in the q a as well um so i think one thing would be removing the underwriting from fossil fuel corporations so right now they know that they can continue polluting and they have the insurance to protect them if anything goes wrong and that sort of stuff so firstly i don't think that they should be able to have that insurance and i think that if they didn't have that economic security they wouldn't keep polluting um, at the rate that they are now so that would be one thing to do I always think that there definitely needs to be expropriation of the power that they have. Um, right now, fossil fuel corporations are, are free to pollute um, and they're free to pollute because of the government that we have. And, you know, democracy means people power, not polluting power. And it's very clear that the people want um, climate justice for all. We know that from when the, the general election was happening and the YouGov polls showed that climate change was one of the top three concerns for voters and that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, we're taking away their insurance and the underwriting, um, expropriating the power that they have, making sure that the Paris Convention, all of the decarbonisation targets that we have don't have exceptions like carbon offsetting, for example. Um, we know that carbon offsetting is actually quite harmful because it can often include um, displacing people in order to plant the trees or whatever there. And that's just not just at all. And the carbon is still being emitted now, even if we're going to sort of make up for it 50 years in the future. So making sure we also remove those loopholes and ensure that when we talk about decarbonisation, it's actual decarbonisation now and not 100 years in the future. Um, and only for these companies, because they're not the Prime Minister's friends and, that's the, and, and that thing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I mean, I think what's quite we we need we need a um you cloned onto every board of every fossil fuel company to hold them to account and a total change in the accounting and actu actuarial system that tackles the risk um to make sure the risk is of climate <laughs> in that context. Thank you. Um Rizwana, there uh, there was another comment in the chat and you um Scarlett mentioned democracy just now and you mentioned democratic governments in your first um, introduction. How can, how can um, there be a contribution to um, environmental justice in places like Myanmar, um, for example, or other regimes where there is no democracy? Uh, I don't know where you actually have a very functional mode of democracy, but it, I mean, Myanmar is a very extreme uh, example perhaps. But see, if you have democracy, you have the debates alive. When you have the debates alive, you actually 
impress upon the minds of the voters. The recent change that we have seen in the US making a come back to the Paris Agreement is because of the fact that whatever democracy they had, they, there was scope for people to debate and say yes or no. I come from a country where, you, where, where we have uh, elections, but where the voters don't vote, but still you have a democratic government. So this is making things extra difficult for us. But democracy and environmental justice, I think, um, have one thing in common, and that is they actually require participation from the general people. For your democracy to be functional, people have a role to play. For your environmental justice to actually deliver, you have to put people's concerns at the center. Just one point, if I may have something that I wanted to say. In this whole uh, debate of having climate justice, environmental justice, we talk about sustainable development, perhaps a notion most exploited. And it is something that's just being, you know, uh, being certified uh, through in, in papers. But then in this world, there are efforts, there are genuine efforts being undertaken by states. Say, for example, Costa Rica, say, for example, Rwanda, Bhutan. They have actually set good um, examples by the governments at the state level for other countries to follow. Similarly, when people talk about, particularly new generation in Bangladesh, they all want to live in US, they all want to live in UK, they want to have three cars, five houses, God knows what. But the thing is, that is not the model of sustainability, but the model of sustainability actually exists. I'm not saying that, a, that the life of a poor farmer is sustainable, but I would say that the life of a wealthy farmer is sustainable. He consumes, but he does not consume in excess. So I think it's important that we bring forward these positive examples set, forward, set forth by the states, by the communities, so that people know what what to go for and what not to go for. Well, thank you. And I think, I think that, that brings us very close to the end of our session. There were, there were lots of questions, but I wanted to just try and pick up those, those big issues um, and we can look at uh, whether or not there are further replies can be made to the questions in the chat after uh, the event. But just in closing, I mean, you're all activists. You've told us about the thing that got you motivated. Um, how now can you just, in about 30 seconds each, motivate others what is your call to action at the end of end of this one because there are so many people campaigning for legislation at the moment the climate emergency uh, bill actually the future generations bill in in the uk and there's going to be one in scotland um learning from wales etc but you know what what do you want people to do who've listened to you today uh, to turn them from the armchair activist joe without your five-year-old into an activist Scarlett, over to you. I think it's really important to remember that power doesn't just lie in Parliament, but it lies in communities and in people. Um, and whenever people come together to try and make change, that's a demonstration of power and to not undermine yourself, even if it's just an email for now that can translate into bigger action, because those emails can build up and the government or your MP or someone can see that there's demand for the policies that you're asking to put in. So basically just go for it also don't be scared you can do lots of things whether that's emailing meeting with your mp like jj did um or going to a protest or so many other things yeah. thank you adi okay um i also really echo what scarlett said um because <laughs> oh many reasons but um <laughs> The, I wanted to just say on that, um, there's a, a word which some people might be familiar with, which is Ubuntu, which it means I am because we are. And I think it's um, something like that, that is incredibly important to carry with us in our like modern societies where we're told all these myths of development and everything. Um, when we return back to the human uh, issues and the human concerns, even as Jojo said about universal basic income, these things aren't complicated when we're able to discuss them with one another. Um, the, really quickly, just um, a word as well, global, which is um, global and local, which means um, we need to in, incorporate the global vision in our local community and our local vision in our global community. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Rizwana. Uh We should not try to win over nature. We should put nature at the center of development and not the other way around. 
and we should not destroy something that we cannot create. Yeah. And Jojo? I think really quite a simple thing in the context of our work around ecocide is we all have networks and we, we all have conversations and the power of the concept of ecocide has been shown very clearly by the fact that wherever we have campaigns and associate groups and people talking about ecocide, which we now have in 15 plus countries, we're seeing a close correlation between those countries and the places where the political conversation is advancing. And that's so reassuring because international criminal law can feel like it's on the moon to most people. But what we know from what's happened with the evolution of our campaign is that where people are talking about ecocide and about making it a crime in their own culture, in their own language, in their own context, it really does make a difference at the political level. So please talk about ecocide. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jojo. And in thanking this um, exceptional panel so much for people who've been on this call to take note of. And can I just finish with John Rawls's quote from his theory of justice, do unto future generations what you would have had past generations do unto you. Thank you very much. Jochen Valjaunzi.